not only is diabetes increasing, basically all forms of cancer are increasing, ALS is increasing, Alzheimer's is increasing. You just start looking at this and the culprits really come down to a couple of things that we're going to explore, sugar and yeah. the manufactured food that we're eating. I was just on Instagram a couple of days ago and I saw this reel that I couldn't believe it was real until I did some research on it. They were basically showing people walking down the street of New York City in 1934. And there were hundreds of them coming by the camera. I'm not sure if you've seen this. It had a caption, where are the overweight or where are the obese people? And as these people are going by, there weren't any. It was amazing, like hundreds and hundreds of people walking by. But as you have talked a lot about in the past, so many of the things that are biology, the way that we were wired to be hunter-gatherers has disappeared from our lives. Yeah. And I end up walking between five to, to 10 miles per day. And people ask me, why do you walk so much? Because it's one of the healthiest things that you can do for your body is my answer. But today we're going to be talking a lot about behavior change and the power of choice, which is something that we love to talk about on this show. And in the book, you've introduced really a groundbreaking concept. You refer to individuals who have reversed their diabetic condition as post-diabetic, where traditional medical terminology labels them as pre-diabetic. Can you delve into why this term more accurately reflects the journey? Absolutely. In fact, maybe the best way to say that is I was having a conversation with Mark Hyman some years ago, and I was talking to him about that when we developed our first behavior change programs around food, we didn't do it for weight loss and we didn't do it for diabetes. We just did it for improved relationship with food. But yet we were facing, no kidding, weekly letters from people telling us that they'd reverse their diabetes. But what bothered me about it, and I was explaining this to him on an interview we were doing, that their doctor was saying, oh, you were type 2 diabetic at your last check-in, but now you're pre-diabetic. And I'm very um, sensitive to language patterns and the almost hypnotic nature of language. For example, we know you don't, you, if you tell a child, don't spill the milk when they're walking across the, the they're going to spill it. Right? Don't spill the milk. You have to picture the thing not to do it. So you say, don't spill the milk. You're basically saying spill the milk. So language patterns are very important. And I, it irritated me that my clients had done all this great work and reversed the condition so such that they were no longer in the diabetic range. And now their doctor was calling them pre-diabetic. Well, what does pre mean? Pre means before. Pre indicates a direction. Pre means you're still going to go there. And I didn't like that at all. The other reason I didn't like it is that I believe that the entire condition of prediabetes was basically created to expand the prescription window. And let me explain what I mean is that you can imagine a bunch of pharmaceutical executives sitting here going, well, shoot, we've sold all the drugs we can. All the diabetics are taking them. Uh, what are we going to do now? We got to find more diabetics. Well, there are some undiagnosed. We can set up kiosks in the mall and we can try and find them and then we can prescribe drugs to them. Yeah, but why don't we just change the A1C level down a little? And if we just move it down like one percentage point, we'll pick up millions of them. No, nah, that would be too trans. That would be too obvious. They'd see that. What we can do is create a new classification that happens before diabetes. We'll call it pre-diabetic. We'll make it a medical condition and that will give doctors the freedom to prescribe while they're in that window, which they currently don't have. I really genuinely believe that something along those lines happened to create this idea of pre-diabetic. And now our clients are moving away from diabetes and they're still in the prescription window. And since their doctors were trained on, by and large, they were trained on the management of diabetes, not the reversal of it. So what are they going to do? They're going to go and give them drugs. And so I said to Mark, I think we should be calling it post-diabetic. For a time when you reverse your type 2 diabetes, you might have metrics similar to those of a pre-diabetic but you are trending in the other direction. And therefore your medical advice should be distinctly different from somebody with the same metrics. And so we call that post-diabetic. And even once they've moved out of the pre-diabetic range, they still remain post-diabetic. Why? Because they've demonstrated a proclivity for developing diabetes. And that means that they need to be a little bit more on point with their lifestyle decisions and a little bit more on point with their understanding of the food industry to make sure that they don't regress and go back to the diabetic condition they were before they became post-diabetic. 